This is Duke University. President of the Law and History Society, and in association with the Haiti Legal Advocacy Project, we would like to thank you for coming to today's event. Uh, Laurent Dubois is the Marcello Loti Professor of Romance Studies and History at Duke University, where he is also the co-director of the Haiti Lab and the director of the Center for French and Francophone Studies. Uh, Professor Dubois graduated summa cum laude from Princeton University, where he received his BA in Anthropology and English. He then received his PhD from the University of Michigan in Anthropology and History. Professor Dubois has been extensively published and is regarded as a leading scholar on Haiti. He has received numerous fellowships and awards, starting with his dissertation, A Colony of Citizens, Revolution and Slave Emancipation in the French Caribbean, which received the 2005 Frederick Douglass Prize for the best nonfiction book on slavery and abolition. This he followed up with his most acclaimed work, Avengers of the New World, the story of the Haitian Revolution, which, was, which the LA Times selected as one of the best nonfiction books of 2004. The American Library Association's Choice Reviews called his next book, Soccer Empire, The World Cup, and the Future of France, the best, most important contribution to soccer scholarship to date. And his most recent book, published just this January and after which this event was named, is Haiti, The Aftershocks of History, which has already received rave reviews from the New York Times and the Boston Globe. In fact, I will end with a review from Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. who had this to say. Uh, very few times have I been able to say that I learned something new about a subject with which I am ostensibly familiar. But this is a case on virtually every page of Laurent Dubois' Haiti, The Aftershocks of History. Dubois, the veritable dean of Haitian studies, has produced that rarest of things, a highly entertaining narrative for the general reader, but one deeply satisfying to the scholar as well. This brilliant book, a compelling and colorful saga of the triumph and tragedy of Haitian revolution and freedom, should be required reading for anyone who wonders from whence the curse on Haiti really emanated. So without further ado, let us welcome the round of Well, thanks a lot for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I don't come to the law school often enough. I hope that'll change. But, um, and uh, I just thought I'd say first, I mean, I, I did my degree in Michigan, um, but in a context with Rebecca Scott and, and others in which the link between kind of law and, and history was, was very tight. Um, so I hope that we can continue to make those connections here. Um, now, as a historian, I, of course, can't resist the temptation to tackle questions with very long term, you know, to, in this case, 200 year narratives. But I'll try to, not, to be brief so we can have a discussion. And of course, I'm happy to talk about uh, more contemporary issues about law in Haiti that, that I'm sure interest a number of you. But I do really think that it's crucial to understand these kind of structures of, of society and law in Haiti to have any kind of clear sense of, of what's going on today and what the future might hold. Um, and it's in particular the case, I think, that in some ways our lack of knowledge about the history of law in Haiti does sort of hamstring us when we try to think about what legal reform would look like in the present um, context. So. Now, as, as many of you know, obviously, the key, it's key to understand the ways in which the, the sort of history of Haitian law begins with slavery, right, and slave law. Um, now, that's true in, all over the Americas, right? Slavery shaped legal systems. But the, the intensity with which that's the case in Haiti, I think, is, is particularly important. Um, and that is mainly because Haiti is, of course, is a, is a country founded by ex-slaves who overthrow a slave system, right? So the, the history of slave law in that context has a different valence um, than it might in other places. Um, it's a process unique in the Americas, right? The kind of overthrow of a slave system and a slave regime by a, a slave population. And it's important to remember that 90% of the population of Haiti at the time of the revolution was enslaved, right? So these are kind of the people who found the new nation. Um, and again, that's something that you just don't really find in, in other settings in the Americas and, and has, I think, long-term implications. Um, now, colonial Saint-Domingue itself, before the revolution, was a, a site of really interesting legal conflict. Um, and there's a brilliant new book by a legal historic, historian named Malik Gatchem at the University of Maine Law School. It's called The Old Regime and the Haitian Revolution, um, sort of an unassuming title, but I would rec recommend it highly, because it really is about the ways in which kind of law both was kind of imposed in a colonial setting, but also was changed by various kinds of, um, you might call them grassroots or kind of on the ground realities, including the demand of, of free people of color, so free people of African descent, who were discriminated against in the society, and even the demands of slaves themselves to get some kind of access to law. Of course, in, you know, slaves weren't were effectively excluded from law in principle, but there's all kinds of ways in which they had sought to use law as well. 
Um, and so Gatcham describes these debates, um, which revolved often around the question of the violence of masters, right? So many, many imperial uh, reformers and governors were actually concerned that overly violent slave, uh, sort of over, 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 overt violence of, of masters against slaves would actually be un destabilizing for a slave system. In other words, they weren't reformers because they wanted to end slavery, but they were concerned about the kind of unfettered violence of masters, and so tried to figure out legal remedies for that. But that, of course, implied necessarily giving slaves some, some possibility of complaint, right, of having a kind of legal status, which itself then undermines slavery. So you have these really interesting debates about um, trying to figure out a way for slaves to testify against masters without actually acknowledging them as legal subjects and so forth. Um, and there's also a way in which this, this really became, a, a, it, to some extent, a pivotal thing in the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution is a complicated event, obviously. Um, but one of the key things about that revolution was that it involved an alliance, alliance between slave insurgents and then metropolitan power holders, right? And an alliance often around kind of legal and political terms. The fact that over in the 18th century, the royal government had in some ways seemed at certain times to be a defender of slaves played an important role in the way that kind of law that existed during the Haitian Revolution. Um, so that's kind of a first, a first key thing. And I do think it's, it's, interest, it's important to understand that in the way that Haitian law, of course, is, I mean, Haitian, Haitian independence law is based on French law, but it's also linked very closely to a set of, of, of radical and revolutionary ideas about law and rights um, that become kind of a foundation in Haitian law, and which are, in Haiti, I think, are considered very much Haitian rather than French, even if they're, right, they kind of understand that, the, that there's origins in France, but they're also understood, in, especially at the time of the Haitian Revolution, when France is under Napoleon, um, that Haiti kind of preserves certain aspects of Republican law that, that, that France has actually turned its back on. So this kind of interesting idea of feeling that they were in some ways ahead of, of their former colonizer is important. Um, no, I don't know how many of you have studied the, the Haitian Revolution, but in, in the Haitian Revolution, there's a way in which the demand for universal rights, right, for, for, for different kinds of legal rights um, and rights to citizenship is kind of pushed forward by slave revolutionaries far beyond what is admitted, admittable, let's say, in the French Revolutionary context, right? So this is why the Haitian Revolution kind of moves further than the American Revolution. Um, but it does so on the, on the basis of demands by slaves for rights, right? Often, you, sometimes using the language of, of a French revolutionary in, uh, uh, context as well. Um, so there is an interesting way that, I mean, I always insist on this, but that in the broader history, if you want to think about the broader history of ideas of rights, just globally as a kind of world history, the Haitian Revolution has this fundamental, pivotal role in that. Um, it is basically the first place where you kind of break break into what I would think of as like an, you know, the more extreme or radical universalism that we've kind of come to accept as our own, in that there are no, you know, there is no human being that can be excluded on the basis of race from those, those rights, um, since the other revolutions had always kind of accepted that exclusion, if that, if that makes sense. Um, but at the same time, the Haitian Revolution also is a, you know, is a social process that creates this, a kind of culture of egalitarianism, a revolutionary culture of egalitarianism, which is as important to its victory, right? So you have a kind of con a confluence between evocations of rights in a kind of emerging rights language, and then the, the formation of a, of a certain kind of culture of egalitarianism that is also very crucial in, in a sense of, of what that means that can, you know, that is a vernacular sense as well. Um, and I say that because I'll, I'll return to the, that and through that throughout the talk, um, just as a kind of fascination of mine and other historians about this is that if you think the the cultural and the level of kind of cultural and social and and, and intellectual complexity of the Haitian Revolution is kind of astounding. Um, in particular, if you foreground and remember the startling demography of Haiti at the time, which is that the majority of the population was African born. The brutality of the slave system and the importance of Saint-Domingue meant that there was a huge pace of imports from Africa. And not only was that, so the majority of people had grown up in Africa and then brought over on the Middle Passage. Not only that, but there were lots of people in Saint-Domingue, maybe over 100,000 perhaps more, who had literally spent maybe a year or two in Haiti before the revolution. I mean, in other words, their, their reality was like Central African or West African with a short period of colonial slavery followed by revolutionary sentiment. And into the early, the 19th century to 1830s, 1840s, the majority of Haiti's population is still African born, right? That changes obviously with this was a big growth in the population after independence. Um, but so then so what you have to then realize is that all of these people are bringing their own senses of the sense of law and ethics and land, right? That whether it's Central African from, from the Congo, um, where there's the Kingdom of the Congo and a set of institutions around there that people have experienced, West African ideas around law that also involved Islamic ideas about law, 
Um, the Central Africans Catholic, so there's kinds of there's Catholic influences. It's just to say that if you think about the kind of intellectual uh, encounters in that space, many of which are, are you know are hard to document, obviously, but are pretty interesting to, to think about. Um, and that's obviously going to shape then, especially because what's unique about Haiti is that that all these kind of confluences exist in other American societies, but nowhere else is there a place where essentially they become you know fully independent at a moment of African majority in order to then create a new society. Um, with with you know restrictions, but nevertheless with a level of autonomy that is that goes further than any place else in the Americas. Um, now, um, if you think about the kind of the Haitian Revolution, obviously succeeded as a kind of moment of unity and a kind of Haitian nationalist you know story about about the revolution puts forward the kind of unity um, Dessalines and these figures who managed to kind of unify. But of course, it's also the root at, at, at the root of a long running series of conflicts, in fact, that are continuing conflicts in Haitian society. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what those that conflict was. Um, now there's a kind of this achievement of Haitian the Haitian Revolution, right, which is to overthrow slavery and empire and establish an independent nation founded on the self-evident principle that no one should be a, a slave, right. So they're in this kind of uh, the, the basic existence of Haiti is predicated on a certain kind of assertion of legal rights um, that is broadly denied at the time elsewhere, right? Um, even if it's, I mean, there are, there are some abolitionists obviously who, who are fighting for it. At the same time, the, the, the new nation's existence was very shaped by the idea that freedom was fragile, right? That's a sort of, that, that within the space of Haiti you had asserted these legal rights, but that that was very fragile, that it could be taken away, right? Um, and there's a kind of long strand of, you could either, you could, you might even call it paranoia, except that it's often justified by the truth, but in Haitian politics that there's a kind of, that freedom might be taken away, right? That there's a way in which those rights are defended by the sovereignty of the Haitian state, and yet um, that sovereignty is, is potentially under pressure at all times, right? Um, and there's, there was plenty of evidence that this was the case, right? The, France essentially refuses to recognize Haitian independence, are actively planning kind of reconquest. For many French rulers in the early 19th century, it's, it's just kind of a temporary setback. You know, like there's a, a group of people have taken control of part of France, and eventually they'll be beaten and taken back, right? Um, eventually, in 1825, Haiti signs a deal with France to get recognition that's an in, that involves paying a very large indemnity, which then creates a kind of cycle of, of debt in the 19th century. The US waits even longer, right? The US is the last country, except along with the Vatican, to rec recognize Haitian independence. And it, recognition only comes after the Civil War for reasons you can, you can surmise. Um, but it's pushed through essentially literally after secession by a series of, of well, abolitionists, Charles Sumner in particular. So you have that, the kind of sense of the fragility. And the whole question, in some ways, of, Haitian, of the Haitian state is how to deal with that, right? In other words, how do you face this kind of this geopolitical context? Um, and in many ways, there emerge these two different approaches that are both of them, I think, quite logical, and yet at the same time can't, kind of antithetical to how do you deal with that. The first approach is essentially um, uh, establishing a secure foundation of self-defense by maintaining the plantation economy, right? So in a sense, finding a way to adapt the previous economic and to some extent social order to the new reality, which is having no slavery, but still maintaining an order in which essentially you have fairly strong measure of control over the population that will allow you to continue producing plantation commodities, right? And it's important because, of course, I mean, that goes with a set of legal ideas about how, how law should be structured. Um, the idea of this was quite straightforward, which is like Haiti was totally structured around the sale of plantation commodities for export, and the only way that they were going to continue to have a kind of economic power that would allow them to buy the guns necessary, but also to negotiate with foreign powers, was to continue that, essentially, right? So the kind of continuity with the, the system. Now, none of them wanted to reestablish slavery, but they faced a basic labor problem, which is that the kind of refusal of the population to continue working on the plantation made them feel like what they needed were sort of legal and military remedies that would essentially provide coercion to, to continue that system. Um, it's like the best symbol of this, and if you've, some of you have traveled here perhaps in Haiti, this, the Citadel La Ferrière in the north of Haiti, which was built by Henri Christophe, one of the early leaders of, of the north of Haiti. Um, it's, a, it's a really astounding fortress. It was built with basically kind of different forms of forced labor. Um, some accused him of essentially having reestablished slavery. That might be too much. Um, it was also built out of, uh, partly out of the stones taken from old plantation houses. So the idea was you kind of create a citadel that would stand against you know, possible reinvasion. But in the process, that means you know, forcing people to work in a certain kind of way and, and so forth. And so the citadel is a kind of one image of the, the, the costs and ironies of that, um, but also kind of a powerful symbol of, of a refusal to return to slavery. 
Um, now, the second approach was what, and this is a kind of crucial thing in the book, is uh, it's what sociologist Jean Casimir, who he knows and others of you may, may know, um, dubbed uh, in, an, in an early and important work called uh, the, the, La Culture Opprimée, so the oppressed culture, dubbed the counterplantation system, right? Um, and this is like a really, I think, vital under, way to understand Haitian, Haitian culture. In other words, a system that's, whose goal was both to sort of to have, which emerged from the destruction of the plantation, was about kind of replacing the plantation with another very different alternative, and was also about refusing the possibility of the return of the plantation, right? Um, so the counter plantation system also, of course, is constructed again by this African majority uh, with models that are taken in many cases from, from, from Africa in some ways. Um, it's basically about thinking, th how, how do you kind of turn, not only turn your back on the kind of plantation, but sort of create an alternative, right, as I said. Um, and in a way, you could say that this, this counter-plantation system was perhaps the most radical production of the Haitian Revolution, right? That kind of, the Haitian state was radical enough in the context of, of the dominant racial order of the day. Um, but this further step, which was essentially to refuse not just, you know, to, to refuse the plantation, right? Which was the rain, a reigning economic model. Um, I sometimes, unfortunately, I hadn't figured this out by the time I wrote the book, so it's not in there. But the, you know, there's a way in which Haitian, the, Haiti is a country founded on an anti-plantation anti revolution. And the last 200 years have involved different people telling Haitians to go back to the plantation and them saying, no, we don't want to go to the plantation. And there's a way in which this keeps happening, right, in, in interesting ways in Haitian history. Um, now, the land that people took over, the thing about it is that this counter-plantation model, you could say, has existed in every post-emancipation society, right? The kind of struggle of ex-slaves to gain access to land that would then be a, form, you know, kind of allow for autonomy and dignity. It's in the U.S. South, it's in Jamaica, it's in Brazil, it exists everywhere. But nowhere was it as successful as in Haiti. And here it's kind of a key point is that we, to some extent, need to reverse our, some of our narratives about Haiti, right, which is often read as a kind of a failure in the 19th century. But there's a way in which it's actually a pretty strong success, right, because what they actually do is create a, an order that I think we can say quite clearly in the early 19th century was, you know, was, was a better place for people of African descent than anywhere else in the Americas. It was economically rather successful in the sense the counterplantation model was not a subsistence model. It was about producing certain types of crops for export, especially coffee, that could be handled in such a way that, it, that you could continue to have autonomy over your labor, right? Um, so it's a kind of, it wasn't a kind of actual withdrawal in any way from the kind of global marketplace, but it was an entanglement in that marketplace on people's own terms. And that's, that's kind of important to know. Um, this is kind of crucial because the other thing about Haiti that's kind of remarkable is that there have been many attempts to reconstruct plantations there that have always essentially met with failure, yeah? which is, again, striking because there are other places in which the end of slavery plantations, Cuba, for instance, you know, then led to new forms of plantations in, 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 in most of the Caribbean. That has been the case. In the DR, U.S. corporations were able to construct a sort of plantation regimes. They tried to do that in, in Haiti, even though they occupied Haiti for 20 years, were never able to. So the strength of the counterplantation system is is important to, to realize in the Haitian context. Um, the marker of the kind of success is, again, another reversal we need to do when we think about Haiti. In the 19th century, Haiti was a draw for migrants. Um, a lot of migrants from African-American migrants, Germans, your other Europeans, people from the Middle East moved to Haiti. Other parts of the Caribbean, people from Guadeloupe moved to Haiti, which gives you a sense of, right, that this was obviously, and it didn't produce many out migrations. So I, I do sometimes, you know, in the 19th century, Europe was producing large numbers of desperate migrants. And Haiti, on the other hand, was actually a draw for migrants, which, which is a sign of, you know, a system that, that to some extent works. Um, but the thing about the counterplantation system is, is success created a huge problem for the country's elites to some extent. Um, because what it took away was a kind of more traditional model, again, the plantation model of wealth, you know, of, of consolidation of wealth and social mobility, which in other parts of Latin America were, were more accessible, even though they were contested. Um, so in some ways, what happened is that they kind of, those in economic power in Haiti had to develop new strategies effectively for for amassing wealth. And those strategies ended up creating a tax situation which was involved, since direct control over the rural areas was, was never really feasible, they, became, they came to take control of essentially export, import, right? And take control of the cities um, and create a kind of taxing system, a tax system, which depends essentially on controlling the, the, the access points between Haiti and the outside world, rather than directly controlling um, production in the countryside, which is, I think, pretty important um, in the long term. Now, so what you have, though, is a kind of stale, a political stalemate, and I'm, I'm going to get back to how this affects law, but there's a way in which, on one level, there's a partial, there's really a stalemate in the sense that 
the rural areas do become kind of taken over by a different kind of model, largely. It doesn't mean that there aren't variations, but, um, and the kind of role of the government, the state, essentially, to sort of retreats, essentially, or, or at least kind of consolidates its power in the towns, partly through relationships with outsiders. Um, I'll get back to the, the question of outsiders in a minute, but, and this kind of stalemate then creates a sort of a, set, a, set, a series of ongoing crises around the Haitian state. Um, that are ongoing in the 19th century. But as I say in the book, it's a kind of odd form of, like, if you look at the kind of chronology of regimes in Haiti in the 19th century and constitutions, it's sort of, it's continual, you know, there's all these upsurges and changes, and most, most of the presidents are kicked out through uprisings of one kind or another. They, they can sometimes seem like more violent, it can sometimes seem like more violent than it was in a way, because the, the mobilization of troops around this was often relatively small, and to some extent, it wasn't like large swaths of the population had a huge interest, or I think, in, in the particulars of what the regime was. Um, in fact, many people were basically busy just trying to avoid, you know, taxation or other things. And there's a kind of way so that the chronology, what I mean is that the chronology of political history can sometimes give you a sense of constant instability, whereas in many ways I think there was a kind of structural stability in a lot of ways within Haiti in the 19th century. So that's kind of important to, to realize. Um, and I think, broadly speaking, the kind of key here is that, to, to some extent, the weakness of the state, like a sli slightly unstable or weak state, suited many people just fine. Right? In other words, it was between a state that, was, that had been consistently involved. So I'll get back to this in a minute. But the fact that the state had, it, when it was at its strongest, like under Christophe or Boyer in another, in another context, those states were also deeply invested in the kind of return to a plantation model. And so there was a kind of connection between strong states and a kind of model that was antithetical to a, to a lot of Haitians. So that, you know, not that people would not have chosen a, a, a benevolent or providential state, but between a kind of state as they had seen it and a kind of absence of state, the latter was in many ways more attractive, right? Um, and even the Haitian military in the 19th century was so thoroughly decentralized that essentially, you know, most of the most of the uprisings had to do with one part of the army in a region kind of rising up against the central authority. So it wasn't like the military itself was was a kind of gave a measure of control to central authority that much. Um, okay, so how do we think about how this shapes legal culture? So what I want to try to end with some thoughts on. Um, there is this kind of bifurcated world, right? This kind of way in which states, you know, this, Michel Rolf Trio famously wrote a book called State Against Nation, which is one way of thinking about it, that Haiti has this kind of bifurcation or conflict that the Haitian nation and the Haitian state don't line up exactly, right? And then there's a kind of very different interests um, in many contexts. And part of that has to do with the role of outsiders in Haiti, which we can, we can talk about. It's important not to overplay this sometimes, because I think it's easy to, you know, Haiti did have parliamentary institutions starting in the early 19th century. These, at times, you know, it varied, but at times had a very robust opposition pol politics, like the parliament was controlled by opposition, and they spoke up, and kind of lawmakers, you know, were kind of battling over what, what the law would be. Um, cons new constitutions, when they were written, would then often sometimes include these kind of demands from, from grassroots politics. So it wasn't like there wasn't any kind of feedback mechanism at all. Um, and there were functioning courts throughout the countryside and local courts and so forth, so it's not as if there wasn't total absence of system. There were these intermediary um, institutions. But at the same time, I think they struggled to negotiate the broad conflicts within Haitian society, and, and that continues to be the case. Um, so I do think that one thing we could call for is that a more robust and careful understanding of the actual institutional legal history of Haiti could provide a lot better understanding of some of these things. And so it's important to, to know that um, uh, you know, that some of these broader structures are also need to be nuanced. Um, but at the same time, to get a, at the broader tensions and pressures that constrained the, um, the way I put it is to think about the, how they constrain the embeddedness of legal institutions within Haitian society. So maybe that's part of the question is what, how embedded or how linked are Haitian legal institutions to other forms of Haitian life or, or, how, or how, how kind of separate are they from them? Um, now you can't talk about this without thinking about the question of language since Haiti also has this peculiar situation, right, of a kind of Haitian legal code that's, large, that's in French. I mean, there's starting to be some, some motion away from this. The last constitution exists in Creole and French. Um, but largely, you're talking about a French legal code in a country where most people don't speak French and most people speak, speak Creole, right? So a kind of, 
Um, now this too, I think, and it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts about that, you know, you shouldn't overplay this too much since I think probably in every society, most of the people in that society don't really understand the laws under which they're governed, right? If you ask me to explain a legal code. So there is a way in which the disjuncture between law and society exists in a lot of places, at least on that level. Still, it's an, an additional step to have your laws actually in a, basically a foreign language, right? And that's kind of what, so for most Haitians, law is essentially in a foreign language. And if a court case goes on, there might be, you know, it's not that judges didn't speak Creole in court cases and so forth, but you're still talking about a pretty strong measure of disjuncture, um, which would be another reason to essentially kind of avoid the legal system rather than try to turn it to one's ends, right? And it is striking how the difference between um, even in colonial times when certain people tried to heavily use the, the legal system at times versus the, the status of the legal system as a place for claims making in, in, in national Haiti where it, where it hasn't functioned in that way. Um, the other thing, though, that's really important is that the counterplantation system actually, in a sense, developed its own, its own I, I, we could maybe call them legal systems or we could call them you know, maybe customary law systems. But there were all kinds of systems to deal with the sorts of issues that a legal system might deal with, um, especially like land tenure, uh, family inheritance, marriage, um, all kinds of things that essentially were taken out of the hands of legal structures and instead negotiated by another set of, of structures, which. Um, which had a fair, fair, fair amount of solidity to them and continue to have a fair amount of solidity to them. Um, so thinking about how those two have interacted in the past, but also thinking about how one might creatively get them to interact in the future seems to me one of the fundamental questions about, about Haitian law. Um, now, it's, we can't really talk about the, the 20th century without at least paying some attention to the, 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 the vast changes in this kind of balance that happens in the 20th century. Um, in particular, the US occupation. And the US occupation of Haiti is, is quite interesting as a kind of imperial American experience. Um, it sort of, I mean, the only real comparisons you have, I think, in terms of the intensity and length are, well, Puerto Rico, obviously, um, Hawaii, obviously, but in cases that, that have not remained part of the United States, the Philippines was the only other kind of of this length of time. And the thing is that the US occupation of Haiti involved like completely direct kind of running of institutions by Marines for basically 20 years. Um, the Haitian constitution was rewritten under by, by the US, essentially by the US State Department. Um, uh, in, in ways I'll mention in a minute. And so you have a, a direct kind of experience of US trying to reform to some extent and, and Haitian law. Interestingly, you do find also that Haitian legal institutions provide resistance to the US occupation, right, um, in ways that, that are quite important and give you a sense that those institutions were there and, and you know, had, a, had a history. Um, there's a great book by Kate Ramsey, who is, who is a, a sort of history and anthropology of Haiti called The Spirits and the Law. And it looks at the long history of the, the legal criminalization of voodoo in, in Haiti, which has gone on essentially since the beginning of, of Haitian independence. Um, and it's a really interesting book because it looks at the way in which kind of law and culture interacted. But one of the things she shows about the US occupation is what the US actually did was to go in and they, they, they looked at the Haitian legal code and a lot of their policies were about enforcing certain aspects of the Haitian legal code that had long been on the books but had, were essentially dormant, right? So what they did is they kind of took, they didn't create new laws at first. They found two convenient things in the Haitian legal code. One was that there was an old law dating back to Boyer uh, allowing for forms of corvée or forced labor to build roads. And the other was that there were laws against superstition, right? Against certain kinds of religious practices. Um, and when they encountered military resistance in the countryside, they decided to deploy, sort of use both those laws in order to quell that resistance. They saw the problem of the countryside, of resistance in the countryside, they needed better roads to kind of get access to the countryside. Um, it would also facilitate economic development, obviously, to build roads. And they also believed and saw that voodoo and kind of religious practices were, were linked to resistance in certain ways. Um, so they take these legal codes that, that and they kind of expand them in some ways. And corvée labor is the kind of great example where corvée labor was, which also existed in the US even until relatively right into the 20th century, was the idea that people could be kind of essentially taxed by having to work for a certain number of days. But their application of it turned into, especially with overzealous kind of military leaders in the countryside, turned into a kind of new form of what Haitians basically saw as a new form of slavery, right? People were kind of rounded up. They would go away for two to three months in camps. That You would get shot if you tried to leave, that kind of stuff. So um, it, it helped to generate a kind of strong military opposition. Um, and then in voodoo, it was a similar case where there were laws against superstition. But interestingly, within voodoo itself, there's plenty of accusations within voodoo itself that other people are practicing witchcraft, right? So in other words, 
it, you can be a, a practice voodoo and think of other people as practicing witchcraft. There was like, in other words, there was this conflict within the country. Um, and under the US occupation, it became a kind of blanket, a, a much less nuanced, right? A kind of blanket condemnation of all forms of religion, which in many cases would meant stirred up, stirred up resistance as well. Um, so those are, there's, a, there's a kind of interesting nuances in, in the history of Haitian law um, that did in turn generate, of course, a reaction within the Haitian system that you know, the legal culture changed, as did the political culture, um, in ways that were ultimately not so great in the sense that the, kind of, the birth of a certain kind of reaction to the U US occupation ultimately did lay the foundation for the, the rise of the Duvalieris regime um, and a new kind of uh, a form of kind of cultural nationalism that was then linked up to a, a, this highly authoritarian regime. And, we can talk about that as well, but um, which had quite devastating consequences in terms of the, the rule of law and how it was put into effect. Um, I'll put it, I'll, I'll just end with a kind of interesting paradox that in terms of constitutionalism in Haitian history, which is interesting, there's been lots of constitutions in Haiti, um, as, as people often comment. Of course, that's not that un, un, uncommon in Latin America, Venezuela, I think it's had 27 constitutions, you know. In fact, it's the U, in the Americas, it's the US that's weird with our, just our one little constitution, you know, we really should update it. No, I'm just kidding. But there's a way in which the, within the Americas, the kind of, the, 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 the constant rewriting of constitutions is actually more the kind of historical norm, right? Um, I just say this because sometimes that's a kind of throw up, you know, like why have Haitians had so many constitutions as if, they're, as if that's sort of some huge failing on their part. Um, but the constitutions are interesting in the sense that there's this back and forth over things like executive power, but also individual rights. So, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff in those constitutions, obviously, and you get kind of back and forth. There's actually a fair amount of stability in the basic constitutional structure, actually, especially after 1889, there's a kind of st stability and there's an earlier one er earlier. But, um, at the same time, the, re the relationship between having a constitution and then that constitution actually really applying is, has, has been a problem, to put it mildly. And in terms of the, like even the early Duvalieris constitutions were, were not particularly oppressive. They were fairly liberal in many of their provisions, except that they had this provision allowing for most of the things in the constitution to be suspended in cases of, you know, insurrection, conspiracy, rumored conspiracy, et cetera, right? So the, the whole Duvalier dictatorship was essentially a kind of series of suspended states of emergency um, during which you had a kind of potentially this legal document that might have allowed for opposition but was never really in effect. Um, interestingly, the constitution that emerges in 87 after the end of Duvalier is a really remarkable, very long, but kind of remarkably progressive constitution, right, in the sense that it has um, ideas of sort of the right social democratic rights that you also find in other Latin American constitutions, um, environmental you know, provisions to sort of about the defense of the environment, things about language, um, all kinds of things, a, a kind of end uh, d d saying that you can't have the cult of personality in politics. There's a number of things in there that are quite remarkable provisions. And I mean, I don't know if there's, there's also issues about that, that, that the Constitution in particular that it, 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 it creates a very weak executive that are obviously shaping Haitian political life today. Um, but that's a fairly, you can understand why that was the case, right? That they're kind of creating, creating a sharing of powers after a 30 year dictatorship. Um, but there is a case where you have, it's, I don't think you're lacking necessarily the legal foundation for a kind of really interesting, and the people who wrote that constitution understood much of what I've been saying today about the disjuncture between different parts of Haitian society, and really, in fact, the, the constitution basically says that. Um, so the question is why that there continues to be a disjuncture between that kind of set of legal documents and possibilities, and then the application on the ground, and what might be done to make those links. Um, which is all to say, I, I do think it's really important to understand that a kind of um, the long tradition of law in Haiti does supply plenty of resources for thinking about the future of Haitian law, um, which doesn't mean that other examples or you know, different models can't be brought in, of course. Um, and we, we had an interesting discussion a few, you know, a few weeks ago about the desire in some ways of, of current reformers to think about Anglo-American law, especially in criminal law. Um, but there are these kinds of resources, but, the, the, but if you don't understand, I think, the kind of social context that, that, makes, um, that can, makes the kind of existence of legal institutions so problematic in some ways, it's hard to think about how to resolve them. So um, thanks. I'm happy to have questions about any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have two questions. Uh, my first is a curiosity. Uh, with the revolution in 1804, you don't really see a revolt against France or French ideas. It seems mm -hmm. like throughout Haitian history and even today, Paris is still seen as kind of the center of political, legal thought. Um, right. The school of magistrates, they go to Paris to study law. Mm -hmm. How come there hasn't been more revolt against France and maybe looking more towards other other right, right. areas that are developed, whether it's the US or something. And my second question, um, 
I just forgot, so maybe I'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the question is like, which France, right? So in other, I think the if you re, if you recall that essentially the, the the abolition of slavery during the Haitian Revolution takes place through an alliance with French revolutionary, literally, I mean, like the French. National Convention dec takes the decree of abolition that was that was brought about in Saint-Domingue and then applies it to the whole empire. Right when it's reversed, it's at, at the hands of Napoleonic and Bonapartist forces who have a very different idea of what law and, and revolution should be. Right. So, the, it, in other words, in, since Haitians understand that there are multiple republic, different ideas, right, of what French law might be, um, and I think in a sense, certainly in the early 19th century, and they continue to, you know, they have. They continue to perform Voltaire and Rousseau plays. They all know Enlightenment thinkers very much. And I really think, I mean, this sounds, it sounds strike, sometimes too, too strong for, especially when I say it in France, but I think in the early 19th century, Haitians thought that they were the real French revolutionaries, you know, that essentially France had failed to fulfill its, you know, they had allowed a kind of dictatorship to return. Now, obviously, there were dictatorships in Haiti too, but the idea that there was a kind of, especially the reestablishment of slavery, which is like, you know, the most obvious failure in a sense, which is like, a revolution that prided itself on proclaiming universal health, human rights ends up re liberating people were then re-enslaving them. Because they, they did re-enslave the population of Guadeloupe, like literally it's the one case of, you know, uh, of having abolished slavery and then reversing that and putting people back into slavery. Um, so there was a sense that there were different Frances. Now, in the longer term, of course, French, you know, French culture, there was a population in Saint-Domingue of people who had been trained in France. Bois Baron Tonnerre and other advisors of Dessalines had spent many years studying in France. So they had links to France. Um, and the language continued to be important. And all of 19th century French like intellectual culture in Haiti is in French and so forth. I think actually in the, there's a, there was a moment in the late 19th century where people were increasingly looking to the United States. Um, and the thing is that the United States, because the United States ended up intervening in Haiti as an empire rather than as some kind of partner, that actually gave new, renewed, uh, like spurred on Francophonia, <laughs> like a Francophilia in Haiti. And it was quite literally the case that people thought, well, this, we really need to sort of link up with, and, and France became, because it was no longer the empire, became a, a better way of, of kind of confronting the US for many intellectuals in the 20s. Um, so, but you can see in the late 19th century intellectuals, I write about one great Haitian intellectual, Antonin Firmin, um, and many of them were very attracted to the United States. They thought of the US was like, this is where capital and, you know, develop, we've never gotten anything from the French, it's just been a pain, you know, why do we love them? So, I mean, there was that whole critique, um, and it's the US that's gonna help us develop, we just need to figure out how to have a, a, a relationship with it. But because in some ways, and, and there was a side in US history too, you know, like the Haitian Episcopal Church is founded by an African-American migrant from Washington, DC. And there were all kinds of links between African-American communities in Haiti. There's Haiti in, in, in Durham, which is a, some, some kind of relic of that, that sort of interest and connection. Um, so there were these alternative ways of linking the Haiti and the United States, but especially at, during the US occupation, you know, the main face of the United States became the kind of military occupation, which and the, the war, which was a really intense war. I mean, this is, they used aerial bombardment for one of the first times in US history. And, you know, it was a kind of, and the kind of hypocrisy between Wilson, you know, Wilson sending troops into Haiti, even as he touts it, the lights of small nations, all that kind of stuff. So now obviously over, by the late 20th century, all that's changed a lot since the United States is you know, deeply connected to Haiti, and there's all, but, but it, I think there's a way in which there's a, there was a moment where another thing was imagine, imaginable. Um, but France essentially now doesn't have much power in Haiti, and so it can seem all the more attractive culturally for that reason, <laughs> you know? Um, so, because, you know, it's like dealing with the empire versus dealing with a kind of old, old ally of, cert, of, of a certain kind, even, so. Mm -hmm. Well, if I, um, Haitian law, interesting in a number of different ways. One is its ambition. Uh, so for example, you talked about the 87th Constitution, the sort of how progressive mm -hmm. it is. Um, yet the ambition can never be fully realized right. under the set of circumstances that the country finds itself. Mm -hmm. So you have, at, at one part, you have a fairly robust structure that if you can make use of, theoretically, could mm -hmm. provide some uh, fairly strong legal remedies. On the other hand, there are places in which um, the legal structure is completely broken. Mm -hmm. uh, so as it applies to judges and the judiciary, right. etc. So it, it's, it's sort of a, um, an interesting set of problems. In some places, 
you, as you said, there are ways in which you could you could draw on the legal structure. It's, it could be robust just from a theoretical perspective, looking at the text. And there, are, uh, but but yet it is so overly ambitious that, mm -hmm. that <laughs> right. you can never make use of it, really. Right. And right. And there are other places where basic legal structures are completely right. unavailable. Mm -hmm. um, how how does one think about that um, problem, and right. how does one approach it? Right. right. Well, I do think, I mean, it goes back to what I was trying to suggest, which is the kind of lack of integration between, you know, even local or basic level state institutions. I mean, for, I think for legal institutions to work effectively, they also have to be embedded in another a sort of set of different, you know, a larger set of kind of citizenship activities, if you or civic activities, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so, you know, the likelihood that people would seek redress in courts in Haiti, I think, I mean, I think people essentially end up in courts if they're pursued in some way. But the court, as a sort of gen as a site that generates rights or kind of defends rights, I think I think that's my understanding has largely been absent in a certain way, right? Um, I mean, during the U.S. occupation, you'd see judges and so forth protesting the kind of more dracon like the U.S. coming in and then applying new types of repressive laws and kind of inc ramping up the repression. So there can be resistance to that. Um, but the idea that sort of like the right to land, you know, the courts, for instance, is a place that might protect you from someone taking over your land or, some, or you know, some kind of issue that you have, I think is, and I do think that, so if you think about that, which is a pretty crucial issue, like if you could imagine that the courts would, would actually to successfully address the sorts of issues that many Haitians face on a daily level with regards to property, then you might have, then, you know, then that might mean that they would also look to the courts for other types of things. But if it's, I think that, so I think in some ways that's where the kind of, the construct, so you're right that the highly abstract principles um, and there's, you know, in some ways, no one can compete like with the Haitian Parliament in terms of superly, in super interesting abstract dis discussions of law. Like there's a real kind of level, you know, of debate even in the Parliament, which I think people aren't that aware of. That, but and there has been through the last 200 years. You know, if you read these parliamentary debates from the 19th century, it's kind of amazing, like that kind of your erudition and so forth. But, but yeah, that, but that's sort of unhinged from actually having a structure that. Um, and I do think, you know, it, it, it exists on both sides in the sense that, so, I mean, Haitians have, especially after 30 years of Duvalier, like, if you get used to thinking, like, the best tactic is essentially to not, to have the state not notice you, you know, to just not, you basically just don't want, right, it's, a, it's like some situation maybe with undocumented immigrants and other, like, you just don't want to be in any relationship with the state, and so the, the, the law system, least of all, you know. Um, and so that means that if it, it continues to exist as a kind of, so the protections that, that are in the abstract can't have any meaning if there's not some kind of balance in terms of what the legal system actually offers people, right? If it's just mainly coercive or punitive. And if, and if as a punitive system, it also doesn't even really work to provide you with basic defense, you know, the basic right to a kind of fair trial and all that kind of, then of course, I don't know. <laughs> so you do need to start from that, I guess. But I do think, like, when we had the discussion, that kind of, if you think about, like, issues of, like, land and inheritance and stuff, on the one hand, of course, many people don't want the state to be involved in it. And there is the danger that this, when the legal system gets involved, it will be on behalf of the more powerful and, right, you know, and the number of people in Haiti who live on land that is not theirs and have done so for a long, long time is enormous, right? So there's a, so you have to think about that from the beginning. And, and in some ways, that's why, again, people would probably would rather not have to deal with a legal question over land, and prefer to just in practice occupy it. You know, so that. Um, so. Was it? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you think that the existence of so many people of Haitian produced by Duke University online at duke.edu.